Okay. All right, so I think we're going to start. Um, welcome to Photo Photo Gallery. I am so pleased to be able to do these Zoom gallery talks and the receptions. Uh, and I'm actually hoping that once we uh, go to live gallery talks that we're able to do a hybrid version of it as well, because it has really opened up the opportunity for people to participate who previously, because of the distance or, you know, whatever, just couldn't quite make it. And I think it, it's made for um, a much broader community to be able to discuss the work. And I'm, I'm very thrilled about that. I'm Pamela Waldrop. And uh, I could ask you guys right now to mute yourselves for right now. And uh, before I continue, I want to uh, invite you, please, uh, if you have a question, uh, to please pose it in our chat. And periodically, either I or Eileen will check the chat, and we'll be happy to ask that question of the artist, if you could do that, please. Um, all right. Again, I'm Pamela Waldrop. I am president of the gallery and uh, one of the uh, photographers here in our collective. We are what's sometimes called a cooperative, but a collective, and was actually formed in 2003. And it's one of the oldest fine art photography galleries on Long Island that originally was established on uh, New York Avenue. And I believe it's been in this location probably since I think 2008. Um, we are a gallery uh, where our members are juried into the gallery uh, through the submission of a portfolio, uh, which might be prints or uh, a, a digital um, online portfolio in, in addition to uh, a curriculum video of uh, uh, exhibited work. And uh, I'm quite proud of the diversity of the people that we have in the gallery. Just to tell you a little bit more about the gallery, um, our members have uh, one solo show per year and have the opportunity to be in up to eight group shows. In addition to that, um, we also have several competitions which help to uh, fund and pay our rent here and uh, really make it interesting. Uh, our next competition up is our seventh international phonography competition. It's not open to uh, photo photo gallery members, but it's one of our very popular shows. Uh, we this year uh, are very pleased to have uh, award winning photographer Pat Beery as our juror and the deadline for uh, this particular show is July 7th. So if you're interested, um, you know, mark your calendar. In addition to that, we have national competition. Uh, we have a best shot, your best shot competition, which is spectacular. Everything that is submitted is uh, hung on our walls. And uh, the most enticing thing about that competition is that two people are chosen. Uh, as best shot winners and one year later, like Tony Monaco and Susan Tiffin, uh, they have their own solo exhibitions in our gallery. So it's, uh, it's a terrific opportunity. Um, let's see, uh, right now in our gallery, uh, we have Andre, excuse me, Andrea M. Gordon with Spherical Magic and Tom Demick. Uh, with overlooked, uh, really exciting that they're they're so different. Mm -hmm. So, um, without further ado, uh, I'll tell you more about the gallery a little later on. I'll tell you about our hours and so forth. Um, oh, I'm going to pop in and say one more thing because uh, I don't think Michael's here, but Emmett Berger is with us, and she is uh, one of our newest members. We're very happy to have her. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, next month, or excuse me, this weekend when we have our reception for our artist invitational, uh, we've just reserved a, a small portion of a wall where we're going to have a pop up show for our newest members. And, uh, and it will have a piece. 
and another member of Michael Dracopoulos. So want to get to the main part of the evening, and that is to hear about Tom Demick's and uh, Andrea Gordon's uh, exhibition. The feedback from people who have looked at the work online and who have come to the gallery has been uh, fantastic. There's a quite a, a very different energy, and I'm, I'm so happy at, at what's you know juxtaposed in here. It's, it's just been terrific. So first, we're going to hear from Tom Demick. And uh, Tom? I'll share the screen. And yes, if you, uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about himself. And as I said, if you have a question, please feel free to uh, pose that question in the comments. Thank you. Okay. Well, just give me a second. All right, everybody can see it fine? Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> All right, I'm Tom Demick. Uh, uh, I guess I'm a fine art photographer. I hate that word fine art, uh, but I don't know what else to call myself. Uh, it seems a little, I don't know, highfalutin or something. Anyway, so about nine years ago, I started taking photographs. Um, I was a teacher for 38 and a half years in Bushwick and Brooklyn. I taught uh, elementary school, pre-K to grade five science. Uh, after I retired, I consulted with the Board of, uh, with the, uh, was it, Board of Ed for a few years. I was a professional developer. I was selecting science libraries for the entire city. It was bizarre. I was writing a curriculum for the entire city. I was a classroom teacher, but this is what I found myself doing. And then all of a sudden I said, where are the palm trees in my life? I'm supposed to be retired. I was doing four full day presentations a week, uh, which is a lot. I mean, you have to stand in front of people for a full day. Uh, and they're teachers and they're the worst audience going. And then I did something I always wanted to do. I started taking photographs. Uh, I travel, but basically, as you can see from the picture, that's me out in uh, Joshua Tree National Park out in California about three weeks before everything went crazy back in the beginning of March, and we all had to go home. But most of my work, I can get good pictures 10 minutes from my front door. I have two front doors, actually. I have a, a house in Glenhead and another house that my parents bought out in Greenport. They paid six thousand dollars for 1949, and I've been there for oof, 72 years in that house. I share it with family, and it's Greenport has changed a lot, but I still tolerate it, and I still go out. But as I said, I like photographing around my houses. Uh, I like the water, but I also like to travel. So the travel is a good balance. It keeps you interested. I've been to some amazing places around the world. I take the pictures and I never show them to anybody for some reason. Uh, I photograph in black and white or color. The image that I'm taking dictates which I choose and also possibly a series as I did, as you'll see tonight. It's a series of images, one of it. And I decided black and white was the answer for that. I basically consider myself a landscape photographer, but I take a lot of other pictures of a lot of different things. But landscape is basically what I love to do. A uh, few examples. Uh, I'm very comfortable around water salt water. I grew up out in Greenport every summer. I fished off the beaches. All, you know, I'd pull all-nighters and out in the wind and the cold and 
getting struck there. So the water is feels like home to me. And it's also provides a nice negative space for my images. It was interesting. I had a solo show a few years ago. I mean, I had about 40, 45 frames hanging, and somebody came up and told me, Oh, you take pictures of trees. And I said, No, I don't take pictures of trees. And then after she left, I looked at all the frames and they were all pictures of trees. So sometimes you just take pictures because you like it. It's intuitive. I designed somebody's landscape a few, many years ago. And the person who I designed it for started explaining the composition I had. And, you know, it's a lot of you just do it. I get more inspiration from painters than I do from other photographers. Um, people have always told me, even when I started nine years ago, that my photographs have a painterly quality to them. Uh, I'm very much influenced by uh, the American Impressionists, Thomas Moran, Bruce Crane, and Carlos de Hayes, even though he's Spanish, but I really love their work. Uh, and my photographs remind people of 19th century work, but I'm not trying to copy anybody's, any specific artist. It's just the way things are coming out lately. My workflow, I'm a project-based photographer. I like doing projects because I'm compulsive obsessive. I, my father always said I have a one track mind. I do one thing and that's all I do. Sometimes I do many projects at once. If I see something that will fit into a different project and I'm doing something else, I'll take that picture and then put it in. And sometimes I just photograph one thing. This is a project I did a few years ago. Uh, there's a shipyard out in Greenport. And when I was fishing off the beach, I was talking to the guy next to me and he said, yeah, you should go to the shipyard where I work. There are so many artists there, they get in the way, but the owner is great. The only thing is you have to ask the owner's permission. Otherwise he gets really annoyed because people just walk in there and it's only right, his property and you shouldn't trespass. And he was great. I could, I could take pictures. They said, come there anytime, 24 seven. You can bring friends, it's fine with them. Just stay out of buildings and don't go near the water. And here are two, this is a, this work barge was there for about a week. I went to this shipyard for a month and a half every day. Sometimes I would go twice a day. And it got, I got so sick and tired of going, but I persisted. I kept going. Uh, I would spend the first 15 minutes whining that I shouldn't be here, I'm wasting my time. And then after about 15 minutes, I would calm down and I would start seeing new things, things that I overlooked all month. And every time I went there, I would get a, a different photo, several new photographs. Now, getting back to the barge, this barge was there for a week. They were uh, spot welding the bottom, sanding, painting. And what I did, I went there several times and got a lot of good pictures just from this, uh, just from this line over here, right over here. I'll show you an image I got. Sort of like another, a guy I know, Scott Farrell, also <laughs> does ship bottoms, but mine are very different than Scott's. And here's this little area here. This is it blown up. And I work with the color because it's my world. I can do whatever I please to a photograph. I don't, I, I'm not a documentary uh, photographer. And that's just a rust spot. Another image I made from that hole was uh, this. It's, uh, these are uh, what's left of barnacles after the, the guys scraped the barnacles off. That's sort of the anchor that's left. And then after a week or so, they sanded it all down, painted it, and goodbye. So these images, nobody else can make. These are mine. 
overlooked. Uh, the eight images I have hanging in, in photo photo all have something in common that I took the picture and it was a, oh, either I buried it on my hard drive somewhere like I did with the first image I'm going to show you or I passed by this seen many times and never really paid any attention to it. And that's why I mentioned the Shipyard abstract series is that you, I find I, it's so beneficial to keep going back, keep going back, keep picking away at a, a location because you see new things every time you go. You overlook stuff, it's just human nature, we all do. You don't see everything Every possible, every possible photograph the first time you go there. You, you get a lot more photographs the first time. It's a lot easier, but when you go back several times, you keep, you keep getting really good photographs. Now this photograph I took, oh, maybe five years ago. I had, or maybe seven years ago, I had just started taking photographs a couple years before this. This was in a photo workshop out in Pennsylvania. And when I took this photo, I was really, really, really excited about it. I thought this was going to be the greatest photograph that anybody in the world has ever taken in the history of photography. And then I got home and I didn't like it. I was so upset. It didn't look good. This is, after, this is after I worked on it a while. And I was so disappointed. And then last winter, the winter of COVID, you know, it's dark at 4.30. I mean, what are you gonna do? I redid my whole website and I was looking through my old in, images and I came across this and I'm thinking and thinking, and I overlooked this for years and years. And then it dawned on me the colors were the problem. The colors were a distraction. So I did a black and white conversion. And now I believe you all can see my cursor. Mm -hmm. I was attracted by this tree and how these branches, these, these shrubs are hanging over the water and this mass. And then you have this mass on the other side. You have the water going between the two masses and then the hills in the background that you can hardly make out through the fog. Mm -hmm. And the color was destroying all that. Your eyes were going to the color. Color can be a great distraction. Black and white can be a great simplification. Um, yes. I, I, I'm curious, because I, I actually am thinking about myself when I go through a similar transition. What would you say is the time period in between when you initially took the image as you were working on the color and then you started making this transition to the, the, the earth tones? I probably took this picture in 2014. Mm -hmm. I started photography in 2011. So 2014, 2015, and then this year, this winter. So, so but, five, five years. Uh, to make my question a little more specific, you initially started working on it as a color image once you found it again. And then how long did it take before you thought, no, this is not the voice I want that you, you decided to? Five years, this winter. That's oh, what, okay. I was, I was reviewing a lot of old images, looking for stuff to put on my website. I saw this and that's when I decided, you know, you, when you only take pictures for a couple of years, I, I'm a very slow learner. It takes me a long time to figure things out. When I do, I do. I figure things out pretty good, but it took me a long time. I, I looked at it again with more, a more sophisticated eye, sophisticated photographically, hmm. trying to, okay. You know, you learn a lot in, as time goes by. Now, this photograph I really like a lot. I, it's out in Greenport. There's a, uh, a nature trail, trail through the woods. I've been walking on this trail for oh, 
before I took pictures mm -hmm. to walk on it. And I've taken pictures there many, 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 many times. I go there, it's one of my go-to places. And this scene is maybe 200 yards from the trailhead. And I passed it every single time. Mm -hmm. And then I never went to that woods in the fog because I prefer going to, you know, you don't, on Long Island, as you know, we don't get that many nice foggy days and I love fog. Uh, so I usually go to the beaches or some other place. I don't go into the woodlands, but last summer it was hard getting on the beaches with permits and everything else with COVID. So I did a lot of forest photography and had to take, uh, was it like actually cycling three times because of mm. uh, ticks were embedded in me and I had deer ticks, I had a lone star tick. And anyway, now I keep the uh, uh, the doxy on hand. I have a big bottle of every time I see a tick in me, I just pop the pill because that's all the doctors do. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I saw this and I said, wow, it's sort of like a clearing uh, Long Island woods they're not that old. They were farms maybe 50, 60 years ago, and they've lain fallow. I don't know what the history of this plot of land is. I remember it being a forest when I was a boy. It was right opposite. The, I don't know if you know Greenport. There used to be a drive-in right opposite this, this nature preserve. So, and then it just said something to me. I, I took a few pictures of this little clearing. This is the best one. I only try and show my best work. I don't want to show mediocre work. I don't want to be, I don't want you thinking I'm mediocre. And I love the way that the trees frame, form a frame around the, the tree in the center of the image. And, you know, I blurred and I added texture to it. You really can't see the texture, but it's there. There are probably about five or six textures there. I use, try to use textures very subtly. I started using textures, textures maybe about three years ago. I spend all the money, all this money on L series lenses from Canon, but uh, I like to soften my images like I did over here and all around. And I kept things a little sharp here and there. But I believe that images should be soft and, and, and some parts should be clear. This image is taken in Florida. I have a very, I guess, unique relationship with a former wife. I visit her every winter. I have grandchildren around the corner. I just have a new grandchild, a little girl who's like, here she's coming. Uh, in July, they're gonna be staying with me for three days and, and I have to child proof this house and this house is not set up for children, but I'll do it. So anyway, getting back to the real story, this little pond is right outside, right around the corner from the house. It's in Celebration, Florida, which is right near Disney World. Everything is absolutely perfect in that town or you get heavy fines. And the fog was just starting to lift I exposed for the sun, which is over here, so, which made the rest of the image dark, which was okay, because new cameras can fill in the, the details in the shadows. It's not an issue. And this is what I came up with. This is hanging in the gallery. Uh, I use the textures with this one a little more heavily than I usually do. Usually I try to be extremely subtle, but I wanted this to have this, this emotion opened up the shadows. Uh, Tom, yes. ex excuse me, you, I may be jumping ahead of the game here, but this one seems to be such a wonderful uh, image to ask this question of. Uh, I, I know you mentioned that you use different filters. Uh, what application are you working in when you're editing? All right, primarily I use Lightroom. I might take it into Photoshop to do tricks. I, might, I kill people in Photoshop. I, I, that picture with the deer, 
Mm -hmm. I shot one of the deer in Photoshop. I got rid of it. I, if there's not enough room on one side, I expand, expand the canvas. But basically in Photoshop, I'm just doing what I call tricks. Most of my work is done in Lightroom. And when I'm adding textures, I use a, a Topaz program, Texture Effects Pro. I did buy the whole big text uh, Topaz editing thing where you can make things look painterly, but I tried several times and the pictures just look like I'm trying to make them look painterly. And that's not the, you know, when you use the brushes and the effects they have, it's, I try to be subtle with them, but it's, they still look hokey. They just, I just don't know how to do it, or I just don't like the program. So I gave up on it. I use Topaz Texture Effects Pro. It's an older program. I have my presets in it. Uh, and I also use, uh, the textures are not my own. I bought uh, textures from Flypaper Textures, and I imported it into Topaz and use it from Topaz. Okay. I, I, I wanted to comment that I think you've quite, you can especially see it in your prints here in the gallery, that you've uh, quite successfully managed to use the textures to create Tom Demick style. And I was just wondering what kind of challenges you run into when you're using these different textures to keep it from becoming an example of that particular app or that particular texture. I'm so, I was thinking my mind wanders sometimes. Could you just repeat that? I'm sorry. Well, I'll simplify the question. What challenges are you uh, running into and you seem to have overcome uh, how are you managing to, to keep the, to make the images your own and not become like what I used to say to my students, okay, that's beautiful, but it looks like a Photoshop example. And you have quite frankly have avoided that happening with your textures. And I was just wondering if you could share any of the challenges that you uh, face when making sure that doesn't happen. Well, it's like what I said about the creative suite from Topaz. You don't, I just, you know, each image is unique. I just play with it to make it my own. I, I'll get really to your point in a minute, but uh, I just keep playing with the sliders and go back and back and back and forth and back and forth. I have presets that I've made, but each image I handle uniquely. I try, now this isn't a good example because the textures are kind of heavy handed, but they're not all over the picture. Uh, I will take away the textures, like I'll show you more in the previous one. Like on this branch, I masked out all the textures here to bring out the detail. Uh, I don't lay the texture over the whole picture. I'm very selective with it. And as I said, I use, I don't know how many textures on this, maybe five, six different textures, but I use each one very, very subtly. So you can hardly see it, but they add up into something that you can kind of like tell this texture, but not really, uh, I don't want to be, use a sledgehammer with the textures. And it's just playing with it. And, uh, you know, Alan Richard and I were having the same conversation. You know, people ask Alan, what did you do? And Alan just says, I don't know, to people. I just kept playing with the sliders until I like it. Basically, that's what I do. Unfortunately, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to, if I ever lost this file, to recreate it exactly the same. I, I couldn't. Mm -hmm because each image I work on, you know, separately. And as I said, there are precepts, but the way I work on it is unique. The editing history is, is gigantic on some of these things. And Thank you. Welcome. Well, I'm glad you said that because when I first started using textures, I met you in the Port Washington Library and you said you were so disappointed I was using textures. That was a while ago. 
your, your work is much more restrained and more powerful at the same time. It's your work. Yeah. It's beautiful. Okay. And the next one. Now, this doesn't look like much, but I was really excited when I finally saw these trees that were in front of my nose. Uh, my Irish mother would always use this thing that if it were a dog, it would bite you. Uh, and this in Port Washington, I live on the other side of the harbor in, in Glenhead, but I photograph Hempstead Harbor quite a lot. And this is a group of trees right outside Bar Beach. I don't know if you're familiar with the area, but, and there's, it's the parking lot just before Bar Beach on a side road. And there's uh, a trailhead that I photographed. It's called Shoreline Trail. It parallels the, sh the, uh, the shore line, the Ergo Shoreline Trail. Uh, for a couple of miles. I photographed there a lot. One of the first landscape picture I showed you was from Shoreline Trail. So I passed this, you know, I'm so anxious. And there's also a terrific boat ramp with, with pilings from the old sand mines. Uh, and I'm so anxious to get where I'm going, which I do a lot, which a lot of us do. Uh, I overlook things. There go the title of the series, Overlooked. And it doesn't look like much. And another photographer I know saw me out there. He didn't know who I was. He stopped the car and he said, oh, it's you. And I told him I was photographing this. And he didn't look very enthusiastic about it. But I wasn't enthusiastic when I saw this clump of trees either the first time. Now, I. have this image is just the raw file. It doesn't look what it looked like when I saw it. There was a lot of texture in the clouds. But again, because the way you have to expose things, you can't get the texture with the exposure I had. Also, I took out my Photoshop chainsaw and cut this tree out, which is a minor detail, but all the little, little picayune things add up. And this is what it became when I was done with it. And the clouds were really there. I don't, I find it morally objectionable to put in skies, to swap out skies with pictures. I just don't do it. I find it morally okay to take things out, but I think I might burn in hell if I put things in. So I try not to burn in hell and I don't put things, you know, I don't add you know, people and things into my, or, or flocks of birds into my photographs. The interesting part of this is everybody that sees this thinks that this is water. But what happened, which drove me, I was kind of upset in February. This was taken last February. And there was a, a crust of ice over the snow. So I would try and walk in the snow with a cane because I had just had knee surgery a few months before. And every so often you would crush, you would, the crust would go and you'd go into the snow, but I never fell and I didn't have to go back into surgery. So it was a happy ending. And that was it. These ripples were here. They look like waves, but they're not. And it's interesting. And when you're looking at it, you don't see it, but the camera sees these reflections. When I took the picture, I didn't see them at all. This is my favorite, personal favorite from the, uh, the Mound series. Uh, it was snowing and man, it was snowing and you could see the direction of the, the, the snow was going at a 45 degree angle there. I just couldn't man up to it. I think I lasted maybe 10, 15 minutes out there. I'm all ge geared up with the arteric uh, clothing and down and everything else, but I just couldn't handle it. So I went back to the car after about 15 minutes and, but it was worth the torture. And uh, this is my favorite image. And again, you know, it's, you have to 
get out there. I must have photographed those trees, must have been there at least 14 times. And it's just a small clump of trees. There aren't very many. You had to be careful. You weren't taking the same picture over and over again. This is uh, taken about 10 o'clock in the morning and the sky is a uh, bluebird sky. I just played with it in Lightroom and was able to turn the sky black without making halos. I assume most of the people here are also taking pictures, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I think if you look closely, is this the one? One of them has, I found a sneaker in the tree somewhere. <laughs> this might not be it. So I, one of them are called sneaker in the tree. I just don't remember which one. It's funny when you, you can work with an image for forever and then all of a sudden you see new things. And this is the same, it's taking, uh, the morning after a snowstorm, you can see that this snow is, I think this is the one with the snow on the trees. And you can see again, I'm, I'm diffusing the quote unquote unimportant parts of the image. I do that with landscape photography a lot. I always diffuse the, what's off in the distance. Photographers, I think, make the mistake and they, you know, worry about depth of field so much and hyperfocal points and they want everything tech sharp from the beginning to the end of the you know into way into the mountains in the background but our eyes just don't work that way we live on a planet with an atmosphere and it makes everything kind of hazy and you have to i embrace that as a photographer as i said i get more inspiration from painters than from uh, photographers and that's what they do Again, a very dark sky. It probably was a bluebird sky again. And I just played around with the dodging and the burning. Uh, my next project, because that was one of the guidelines you gave me to talk about what happens next. This is something I'm toying with starting. Uh, I'm starting to look down at things. Yesterday I was, photo I was at Tappan Beach out walking and I brought a camera and I'm photographing uh, the cracks in the uh, parking lot there. I tried doing that before, but there wasn't enough contrast. I was out in Denver visiting my son and they have these beautiful, he lives in a historic, he lived in a historic area and they have these beautiful slate sidewalks and they all had these beautiful cracks in them, but there was no contrast. So in Tappan Beach, all the cracks are filled with sand and the sand is white. I haven't processed these yet. I, the series might work, might not. But you know, I, I look. I don't look down enough and take pictures. So I'm, that's that's my next direction to look downwards. And uh, questions and comments. And thank you very much for this. You know, paying attention and hearing me drone on and on and on. Okay, that's it. I have no questions, but your pictures are magnificent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. It, it's really interesting to see um, how your your use, your awareness of space is different in the compositions that you're approaching now. And I, I wonder how much that's influenced by, uh, you know, having been quarantined for a long time. And, and you know, how, how is the how is the opening up of the pandemic uh, after the pandemic affecting what you're doing now? You know what, Pam, I try not to think too deeply into my photography. Mm -hmm. I just take it as it's like I mentioned, I alluded to that uh, landscape I did for somebody. I didn't think about it that much. I just put, you know, a clump of grass here, a clump of grass there, and then it turned out to be three clumps in the perfect spot. You just do it kind of a thing. Uh, I do agree with you that color gets in the way very frequently. Frequently, but sometimes I embrace it. I I desaturate my colors quite a bit. I don't. When I first started, like everybody, you know, you put up that, that saturation slider all the way to the right. Uh, but now I go more to the left. I desaturate. I'm I'm a big lover of black and white. 
and I shoot color too, but I, I love black and white. Yeah. I like color more, but people tell me my black and white photography is better, but I enjoy the color. When I take pictures, I have a live view. I, I shoot through the, the live view. I don't use the viewfinder at all. I just carry extra batteries. And uh, I have that converted to display in black and white, even though I know it's going to be a color image, but it simplifies. It's what you're saying. It does simplify the composition so that I can. I have a hard time getting a good picture. Be honest with you, they don't come easily. I have to work very hard, and this is something that kind of helped. Live view monochrome helps me visualize. Well, they're beautiful images, and as beautiful as they looked on the screen, folks. If you haven't had an opportunity to come into the gallery to see the exhibitions, please try to get in here. Uh, this I coming, have seen them. they are the magnificent. Thank you. Yeah, we were there that day. Tom, your work is beautiful, really. I, I use a lot of layers myself. I think yeah. you're you mastered it, really. It's uh I think it's also very bold that you use a lot of uh vertical formats for your landscapes, which you don't often see. And I think they're done wonderfully. They're really amazing, beautiful work. Thank you. I yeah. I mean I made the trip in, I wanted to see your work in person. Oh, wow. I was there on that day. I didn't get a chance the opportunity to speak to you. Uh but anyway, but the show was beautiful. Both Where are you from? Uh, Manhattan. I'm in the Barbizon Hotel. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I, right. Yeah. Wow, that's that's a nice compliment. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely beautiful. And you know, it really your talent exceeds the nine years. I know people shooting 30 years and they can't get results like that. So that, wonderful. Yeah. Love it. Love your work. And I'm gonna follow you, follow your work mm -hmm. going forward. Hey, thank, you. thank you. Tom, one of the things that you did not speak about. Uh, and I correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe you do your own printing, correct? Yes. They're okay, all, and and to I'm really to, to really appreciate his images, you need to see the printed images. They they are stunning. And as I said, the the, <clears throat> the last day for the exhibition is this coming Saturday, and we're open until six o'clock. So, um, well, is there anyone else who has another comment or question? Uh, before we move on to hear Andrea, um, I just a, a little commercial break here for a moment. Uh, also happening uh, this coming Saturday uh, is our artist invitational reception. We have 11 photo photo gallery artists and there are 11 guest artists. Uh, who are exhibiting in the back gallery for the months of June and July. Uh, Tom and Andrea are also uh, among the artists who are uh, exhibiting a piece in the back, as am I and, and Eileen. So uh, if you're nearby, please, please stop by and uh, join us for the reception or uh, come back during July and uh, take a look at the show. Uh, and now... Uh, I want to stop the screen share, right? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. And that's five to seven, right? Reception. Yes. Oh, thank you. Eileen just reminded me the reception uh, this coming Saturday is in the gallery. It's not going to be a Zoom reception. We are having just a live reception, but I am hoping that during the month of July, we'll have some gallery talks by the people who are represented. If it, uh, I see Randy, Randy Elwhite, is that you? uh alan richards also has works in the show susan tiffin uh it's a terrific show so um if you get an opportunity stop by uh now it's just it's actually absolutely fantastic that there's such a difference between tom's work and andrea's the the uh the jump in energy is palpable when you walk in <laughs> you know palpable when you walk in through the walk through the door so please um Andrea is uh, was a member of our gallery uh, for many years, and she can tell you a little bit about that. And I'm looking forward to hearing Andrea tell us about her work. So please go ahead. Welcome, Andrea. And thank you again, Tom. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you. It was a pleasure being on the walls with you. Yeah, um, welcome. Okay. 
Um, when I create an exhibit, I reach for those who can help me present my work in the best light possible. Thank you, Dennis Ponset, for validating this so many years ago. For this specific exhibit, Spherical Magic, I wish to thank Holly Gordon for suggesting I revisit my marble series when I express some discord with my reflection and illusion idea. Mr. Andrew Darlow, digital and printing consultant, Ms. Lindsay Varho, Blazing Editions consultant, Vista Print for coming to the rescue, Scott Farrell, another printing consultant, and photo photo gallery members, Pam, Paul, Eileen, John, Larry, and Tom. I am influenced by people who are strong and different and who embrace their craft with a passion that is not stopped by what people think. Individuals who have a heightened sensitivity and reaction to life. These are just a few of the people, David Bowie, Angel Adams, Patti Smith, Helen Keller, Annie Leibowitz, Salvador Dali, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Richard Gee. I am at this point, I am Andrea M. Gordon, owner of Universal Touch Professional Massage for the past 33 years and heart to heart photography for the past 12 years. The creating of Spherical Magic was a most incredible journey with many curves that I was able to navigate and thus bring this exhibit, exhibit to fruition. I am very proud of the results and it gives me immense satisfaction to receive feedback from the viewers of Spherical Magic that mirror my vision for the exhibit. My artist statement for the exhibit is on the Photo Photo Gallery website and in the gallery if you wish to read about the full journey of spherical magic. To summarize who I am and what type of photography does for me, I will read you the following statement. I photograph from my soul. When I am involved in a shoot, the feelings experienced overwhelm and hug me with exuberance. It makes me feel alive and connected, no matter what. Now, I'm emotional, and that's what this exhibit did. This exhibit, when I was shoot, I'm going off here, but this exhibit, when I shot it, made me the exuberance and the aliveness and my heart beating made me realize what COVID had done to me that I had died on so many different levels. That's what this exhibit did for me. It made me feel alive and connected. No matter what I am shooting, the essence of being stimulated visually and emotionally connects me to myself, what is in front of me, and the world. This for me is a gift beyond measure. And my vision is to impart these feelings to my viewers. Sorry about the emotion, but this is, this is real. This for me is a gift beyond measure. And my vision is to impart these feelings to my viewers. That is always the heartbeat of what, why I do what I do. I'm going to interrupt you for one second here, Andrea, because yes. that emotion that you are so passionately embrace comes full force in your images. And we are happy to have that energy here in our gallery. So please continue. Thank you. This, I'm just going to show you this. Um, can we bring this on the screen somehow? Uh, oh, maybe not. OK. Hang on. Oh, there it is. I guess they can see it through me. I'm just showing you this. This was a template sent from the printing that started the journey. Um, this is this image is actually not in the exhibit, but this is what started the journey. As a trained trauma touch therapist, I have been educated in how to embrace the moment and go with it. I must admit that this training falls over into my photography. I start a shoot and allow its evolution to, to unfold moment by moment, creating its own birth. During the shooting of Spherical Magic, <laughs> which originally was titled Marble Mania, by the way, came a long way. 
the following items were brought in spontaneously. Um, and I, I have brought them to show you. These are what were used during the shooting of Spherical Magic. This hat. This blue mat. This high Q game, and the most the most dear to me um, part of this exhibit is very heavy. Was this bowl? And when I came home with the marbles, this was the first thing I saw in my kitchen, and I thought to myself, "Oh my God." That's where I'm going to shoot this, this shoot. And there are, well, you'll see as we go through the images, what this bowl gave was a lot of movement, a lot of joy. <laughs> movement and joy. So this is what I mean by having the trauma training. And you learn in that training when you're working with a client that you need to be in the moment. You're not in the past, you're not in the future, you're in the moment, and you work with what you have. And that's what happened with me with this shoot. I came home, I saw the bowl, I was like, that's where I'm going to start. And the other things just unfolded as I did the shoot. This is, this is in the artist statement, but I'll just share it because I happen to have it. When I made the decision to change from illusions and reflections to the marbles, I was gallery sitting, coming to gallery sit, and I literally found this marble outside in the street. So it kind of validated for me that the shoot was supposed to go in that direction. There's actually only one marble game of life is the title. There's only one image that has this marble in it. And I guess as we go through, you'll get to see that. Okay. I guess we're ready for the... Happiness times three is this title. To achieve the largeness in the shot, I used a flash and I shot it in the dark. I was at floor level and I zoomed in. And as I showed you, I used the blue sheet. Okay. Burst of marbles. This was shot in the bowl which gave it the movement that I wanted. And the same thing, it was shot in the dark with a flash. Uh, Andrea, if you could go back to that last image for a moment. Um, do you, I, I really don't know your process. Uh, how much of this shot did you achieve the results you wanted just from this shot or how much of it did, then did you do something, you know, some editing post-processing afterwards? Yes, there is some post-processing editing. Okay. Are you, not, not a tremendous amount, but yes. Okay, and are you editing within, uh, a phone app or what what sh what is your no the editing was done lightroom photoshop okay whatever right. is done but i it's it's minimal editing mm -hmm. okay beautiful composition thank you distant clarity is really the only um this is in the uh in the artist statement that's online and in the gallery. I had originally, I had an exhibit 10 years ago that were with marbles. And I was going to revisit that, 
um, I guess I'm going into what was in the artist statement, but I was going to revisit it and I did start to revisit it, but there were problems that I ran into. And I just thought to myself, I really need to shoot a whole new Marvel series. So I went, I got new marbles, did the new series. This one, Distant Clarity, is one from the only one in the exhibit that is from 10, 12 years ago. And it has a different feel to it than the others. Um, this was shot 11 years ago in a coffee place in Greenlawn. And it was literally shot in a drawer full of marbles. Um, the post-processing was added to the original image. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, do a little segue here because I have to share. The reason why I get, did the original marble shoot was there was a gentleman that was watching me hang the exhibit. And he, came, he was a gruff looking guy and I didn't know him. And he came over and he says to me, um, you do really nice work, but you should really shoot my marble collection. And I looked at him like later. <laughs> I just couldn't really deal with him at that moment. And that night I went home and I remember this vividly. I literally thought to myself, you can live life like this or you can live life like this. And I called him up, he had given me his card and I said, I'll meet you at Urban Coffee, fine. So I go there and literally this man walks in, he rolls in a case with four drawers it was a 40 year collection, marble collection from Germany. And at first he almost wasn't gonna allow me to touch the marbles. And I'm thinking, how the heck am I gonna do a shoot? But eventually he, he trusted me and he gave me the opportunity. And it was a fabulous opportunity. And I think it's a lesson in life in reference to how you live your life, whether you're open or you're closed. This one is the black, it's called black and white together. I think it's rather, it, I titled it prior to um, what just happened with the holiday coming about. Um, it, and I did it because I wanted to show the difference between burst of marbles, between a color and a black and white image. And the color I like, but black and white, as we could tell from Tom's work as well, it has a dramatic effect. It gives it a dramatic effect. So basically this is there to show the contrast. Marble gold, this shot was taken looking down into the bowl, slightly angled. Um, again, in the dark with the flash to enhance the movement and the color. Green with love, this was shot from above into the glass bowl, again in the dark with color enhancement. This, I did enhance the color on this with post in post-processing. Post Some of these marbles look like they're floating. Yes. It's beautiful. It happened, it's, Obviously you have to do it very quickly because the marbles move around, whether they're in the glass bowl or they were on this flat piece, but it's the angle. It's the angle at which you're shooting them that give them that almost floating ability. Andrea, were these backlit? Where, where was your light source? Yes, you could say they were backlit. Um, because there was a light, I was shooting them in the living room. There was a light in the kitchen that was on. The living room was dark, so you had the flash and the light from the back, from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. These marbles, colorful, colorful room, the marbles were arranged on the blue board 
and I shot them from the floor level. Now, when, you, when I say floor level, I mean floor level, like I was flat on the floor, <laughs> you know, looking at the same level. Um, and again, it was difficult to shoot because I, you had to shoot them quickly because they were moving. Um, it reminded me of when I shot them in the drawers 10, 10 years ago. You had to shoot quickly. Andrea? Yes. Uh, my name is Mark. I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, you mentioned before that you uh, sometimes would change or enhance the color. What what would prompt you to do that in one of these photographs? Can you can you describe it? Just more vibrancy. I mean, I'm not. I didn't do anything like extravagant. It it just to to make it to. Well, again, I'd like Tom was saying when you're turning the uh, the dial, so to speak. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. Just to enhance what already was there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, flowing, this was something I didn't mention before. Um, by mistake, there were some marbles in the bag that were not round. They were a flat marble. So I didn't really love them, but I did use them in one or two. And this is one of the ones. So all of those white ones are really flat, flat mar what's known as a flat marble. They were shot together because I, I felt that they did give a difference in depth and texture. And they also, it, I shot it down in the glass bowl to create the movement and the symmetry that the glass bowl was able to give. The color coordinated between the glass and the center of the bowl. The, the outskirts of is that around here? Yes, it happens to be right here. Um, I, I appreciated the fact that the flat marbles were actually picking up on the, the, the light in the bowl from the flash. So it gave, for me, it gave it more of a, it gave it, it continued the movement going around. Yep. Hanging together. Again, as I told you, this whole exhibit um, made me realize what I had gone through just like we all did with COVID. So a lot of the imagery when I was titling them came from that experience as well. Obviously, we've all been hanging together for a long time. Um, the bottom of the, the angle at the bottom of the marbles, excuse me, I zoomed in closer. These were obviously the flat and the round marbles in the bowl. And I zoomed in closer to enhance the spherical shape and the colors. The colors are always exaggerated with the flash in the dark. So that's kind of where this one went. Excuse me, a lot of people seen in, can you go back on that one? I'm just sharing this with you because a lot of the people who have been to the gallery, um, one woman specifically was just amazed at uh, what the reflections in the marbles. That's, she just was in that. And so a lot of people saw either an angel or a, a sea creature in that, the marble right in the front there. I see a bird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, there's no right or wrong. No, I know. You see. I know. I know. I see a manta ray. Yes, <laughs> yes. This one is dear to my heart because, um, as you could tell, it came from the, the hat. Um, I actually lined them up 
in the hat. And the original one, it just was no good. It just, the focus, it wasn't clear and I really had to discard it. And I really was upset about it. And I thought about it and I'm like, you know, just do it again. And I did it again. And it was like, just like one shot. That was it. I lined them up, I shot it, came out perfect. So this one has, this one I should have named Perseverance, <laughs> to be honest. Um, what I do like about this that a lot of people do not noticed is that the last marble had fallen and it was on the rim of the hat. I would say um, of the people who have come into the gallery, maybe half of them noticed that. Uh, one second. Um, obviously the marbles were shot on top of the straw hat in the dark with the flash. Um, and well, I'm repeating myself. This was, I just wanted to do it again because I wanted this in the exhibit. So I'm glad it made it in. This is Marble Game of Life. This is the only image that I shared before that has the marble I found outside of the gallery. It actually looks like a globe to me. Um, it's, I don't know if you really can see it, but it's on the left top. It was shot on a high cue wooden board, board game, ground level with the flash in the dark to enhance the color and the size. And again, the title was I think um, inspired, I don't know if that's the right word, but inspired from COVID. Next. Okay. And this one appropriately, I think for all of us, I titled it Room to Grow. It was shot on the high cue wooden board on floor level with the flash in the dark Spaces were left on both sides to bring your eye into the center with that is where the clarity is. At the apex in the middle and the left. And I thought it really was um, extremely, how can I put it? It was a visual that really reflected what has gone on. For me, I can't speak for everybody, but when, when you look, I think when we look at everything close up, it can be a little fuzzy, but in the distance, there might be some clarity. And the sides not having the marble specifically, I didn't put them there, is that there's room to grow. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. I have several questions, of course. <laughs> uh, first question is, I know you did a marble series several years ago. Um, what do you think is the biggest difference between the one that you did years ago and your most recent exhibition? I think because I was able to arrange the marbles. The one 10, 11 years ago, I was in a coffee place. This gentleman was very gracious, but very um, concerned about the marble being manipulated. And so this shoot gave me the opportunity to place marbles where I wanted them to be and to also shoot them the way I wanted. There, I was constricted. I remember being in the shoot and, you know, in the beginning, it was like, ah, this isn't really working. You know, he wouldn't let me touch them. You know, he didn't want me to move them. And even when he gave me permission, the flow was not there. 
it took a while to get there. I think I was there maybe two, three hours. Being in my own home, you know, literally laying on the floor, shooting from an angle that I really wanted to shoot at, it just gave me a lot more opportunity to, to create what I wanted to create. So if I can uh, just put a personal comment in here, because you had actually spoken to me about whether or not you should revisit what you did before or take the challenge to do the new shoot. And I suggested that you go for it. And uh, I think you did, you know, very successfully. And it sounds like from what I can, what I hear and what I see is you had a very clear vision of your intent and uh, you set about to accomplish that uh, quite successfully. The other question I had was, you know, you could choose to have had these printed on many different substrates, but many different media, and you chose to present them as metal prints. And I was wondering what your thinking was behind that. Well, there are two really. One, there's less chance of breaking <laughs> without glass. But also I had just done my orchids. My last exhibit was orchids and they were on the metal. And I feel that the metal truly does um, display the work. It just, it makes it alive. And, and the fact that there's no frame, there's no mat, you're just looking at the, the total image is what you're looking at. It just, for me, it just seems. Thank you. It's convenient also to be able to hang them. I can ask lots more questions, but is there anyone else who uh, would like to make a comment or ask uh, a question? I have a question in the chat. Uh, thank you, Sandy from Sandy. Uh, did interesting question? Did you, Andrea? Did you pick the title first, or did the photo inspire the name? It's an interesting question because it really, just like the whole exhibit went through a metamorphosis, the title went through a metamorphosis. Like I said, originally it was some crazy name like Marble Mania. Uh, or marvelous marbles. I mean, when I think of them now, I mean, I really was thinking of using that. It, um, it's what happens when you create an exhibit. It just kind of, it plays, it builds. There's a momentum that's created. And I'm not even sure where where I found the word spherical, but it just, it just happened. But when it did happen, I knew that was it. That was it. And thank you for coming, Sandy. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Andrea, where do you see yourself going from here? Uh, are you gonna continue to pursue this particular theme or uh, what, what, what's in your future? With each exhibit that I have, I say that it is the last. Um, the thing that really got to me with this was correlating the way I shoot and how it, it over, it interrelates to what I was taught in the uh, trauma work. Um, I would say what I see in the future is exactly what happens. I shoot because it's, it's, like, it's like oxygen to my blood. Um, it, it's exhilarating. It makes, me, it makes me feel alive. And I love to, I can't see myself not doing it. I think when you are an artist, <laughs> I think of my, my dear mother. Uh, she was a fabulous uh, pastel artist. And I remember once coming in, she was working on a piece and I was like all excited. Oh, mom, this looks great. And she turned and looked at me and I'll never forget the energy. <laughs> and she was like, this is torture. 
Do you have any idea of the torture this is? And now I do, Mom. I mean, it's nice when you're on the other side. It truly is. When, you've come, when, when you're in the gallery and when I look at the wall, it's, it's magnificent. But it is a roller coaster ride to get there. And as Pam and Eileen and many people in the gallery know, even my friends, family, um, I understand what she said. It's not easy to get to have an exhibit like I am so, I am so proud of this exhibit. And the reason being that the vision I had is exactly what people are sharing with me. They are affected the way I was when I was shooting it. You know, words like, well, of course, magical is in the, in the title, but, you know, spiritual, colorful, moving. Um, this is what I wanted. But, but it's such, I mean, I do have to share, I know I'm repeating myself, but I have to share, it was such a juxtaposition of realizing because of the excitement and the thrill of creating it, it gave me, it gave me that opposite. It gave me the reality of what COVID had done to, to all of us. And that's when I decided that I wanted the exhibit to be the opposite. Well, you succeeded, Andrea. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. I mean, from the comments I've gotten, I, I feel it. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, I've had many exhibits before. This is a very different experience. This is, this is wonderful. Thank, thank you very much, Andrea, for sharing uh, with us your process and your intent uh, and everything that you have about your exhibitions. Um, Thank you. Does, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Oh, um, I just have to say a new, I'm so happy you're here. Andrea, where, where do you sign your work? I noticed, is your work signed on the front? It's not on the front, on the back. It's on the back. Okay. And your work is for sale or is it NFS on those? No, it's for sale. It's for sale. I mean, there are the size the sizes are all here, but then, you know, I do have, uh, I'll just show you each image. You know, there are smaller ones. You can go in and I'll be right there. Uh, Andrea, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's quite all right. Andrea, I just wanted to say, Oh. That we that we finished this up in the car, <laughs> but we watched. Oh. Oops. Can't hear you. No, can't hear you. She's muted. You, can you hear me now? Yes, now. Okay, we finished this up in the car because we needed to move, you know, <laughs> go someplace. But we watched every second and we listened to every second. And we thank you so much for inviting us to this. You are really are so articulate in helping me dive into the photographs. And I think you're such a master at naming them because the way you name them gives them such personality that I have a whole new depth of understanding. So thank you so much. And we love you. Mwah. Love you too. And I'm so glad you could, you could finally come to an opening. <laughs> Pam, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, it, it works so much better when I'm unmuted. Uh, <laughs> uh, at least that's what some, most people tell me. <laughs> Pam, Pam, I just, anyway, I, I do want to um, tell you how much we appreciate everybody being so supportive and participating in our gallery talks. Uh, 
And uh, I put a few things in the chat, but just as uh, a reminder, if you would like to see some of our previous gallery talks, uh, Eileen Novak, our uh, video guru, uh, she has established a wonderful photo photo gallery YouTube channel. And I believe there are probably over 30 videos on there now. Uh, there are gallery talks from national shows from uh, Tony Monaco and Susan Tiffin and uh, so please uh, take a look at our YouTube channel, you can also check us out on photophotogallery.org our website and Facebook is photo photo gallery with a lowercase f uh, and then uh, we have a very active. Um, Instagram page as well. So uh, please take a look at those. Uh, I do want to mention that uh, uh, at, the, at the height of COVID, our gallery closed for five months, five very long months. And uh, this past September, we reopened twice our size. And we are just thrilled to do that. Uh, since then, we've been very fortunate to uh, have six I believe six or seven new gallery artist members, and we're looking forward to seeing those solo shows uh, coming up during the next year. Uh, meanwhile, we have been like every other place busy trying to get back on our feet. And so should you be so inclined, if you go to our website, there is a donate button there. And we are always graciously accept any donations that you would uh, kindly like to make and uh, I mean I, I have to uh, oh thank Tony Monaco again for your generous generous contribution um, so folks uh, I um, hope to see I you am. oh go ahead you want to mention that we will be having salons if, if any non oh, yes. interested thank you yes we had a, a, a wonderful um, thank you very much Susan uh, we had a wonderful uh, salon reception prior to being closed for COVID. We would meet here uh, once a month uh, for with people who were not necessarily members of our gallery. And people would bring digital files, they would bring prints. Uh, and it, Paul Mealy uh, would uh, facilitate the group. And it was uh, a, a give and talk, a give and take uh, artist time to just share your work in progress and get feedback and hopefully that's going to resume soon um and the other thing i want to mention is that if you are interested in membership um if you go on our website there is a, a link there to click for that and uh we uh you know we ask that you submit a portfolio as well as uh give us a link to your website online we're always Looking forward to see new works. So Susan, anybody else who uh, is here from the gallery? What did I forget? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pam, if you could just check your phone and uh, if you could show uh, Andrea the text, that'd be great. Uh, the, let's I see. I sent you a text. I sent no, you a text. No, no. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Thank you the very much. Time. Thank you, Tony. Okay, I, I will kind of jump off uh, off topic here for a minute and plant a little bug in someone's ear because we hope it's going to happen. Uh, earlier this year, when uh, we had our Your Best Shot winners exhibitions, and Susan Tiffin and Tony Monaco did uh, had wonderful exhibitions here, and Tony mentioned that he might be interested in doing a workshop. So we're going to ask you about that again, Tony. There's a lot of interest in it in your techniques. So please let us great. know. Okay. Uh, I would love to, as long as, as long as you charge a lot, it all goes to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Andrea and Tom, thank you both. Uh, wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you both, They're beautiful, beautiful work. Yes, beautiful thank work. You. And I hope thank that you. the next time I see everybody, it's here in our gallery. We're at 14 West Carver Street in Huntington downtown village so uh please come by we're here on thursdays from 12 to 4 and thursday friday saturday and sunday from 11 a.m 
to 6 p.m. Conveniently located between the shed and Portofino, so you can't go wrong. <laughs> okay. So thanks so much, folks. Have a good evening. You too. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.